What was your earliest, uh, I guess, introduction to professional wrestling? Was it something that a family member put onto you or a friend? Yeah, I think the reason that uh, wrestling has such a special place in my heart is because the connection that wrestling forged between my father and I. Um, when I was seven years old, uh, my, my parents are divorced, and when I was seven years old, I was with my father for the weekend, and it was a rainy Saturday. We were going to go see a movie. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to see someone fly before we left to go to the movie theater. And he just put on the television. We were standing because we were leaving. And he mm -hmm. just put on the TV and he put the remote down the table and Superfly Jimmy Snooker just sailed across the TV. And my father looked and saw my face. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? We'll go to the later movie. And we sat down together and we watched wrestling. And my father began to tell me stories about when he was a child, how he would watch wrestling with his father. And lo and behold, it was three hours later, and we never went to the movie, but the way my father told the story and the way we connected, it was instant like that. And I'm sure for the rest of the weekend, I just bothered him with so many questions. <laughs> and he was very good at describing the wrestlers, um, Antonina Rocca, Haystacks, Calhoun, and, uh, you know, all these different images that he would create with his words. And I think looking back, that's why I like to do commentary, to create images with my words. And... Um, that Monday, he had come home, my father had come home from work and stopped by my mother's house where I was living and dropped off three wrestling magazines, which I still have to this day. Well, I heard you have a whole stack. Yeah, I have about <laughs> 2,000 wrestling magazines that um, I'm still not in a position where I'm going to sell those just yet, but uh, yeah, they're in a storage place in College Point, Queens. But uh, those three wrestling magazines, I sat and I read for hours. And looking back, I think my father knew that a precocious seven-year-old wasn't going to sit down and read a textbook. But if he was going to learn to read, it was going to be through the medium of wrestling magazines, comic books, these kind of things. And then it all just kind of exploded from there. Did uh, Was commentary something that you wanted to do from the beginning? Or was there ever a time that was like, I want to be a wrestler? I, I mean, eventually you did make the decision, I want to be a wrestler. But. Well, I didn't make the decision. The decision was kind of made for me, someone greater than, than me. But um, I was always doing commentary in some form of another because I would always play with my, my figures, whether it be G.I. Joe figures or Star Wars figures, and I'd always just be doing running commentary. And a lot of times I would catch my mom or my sisters or my dad standing by the door and just watching. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I knew they were watching, so I would turn it up even more. That's where the <laughs> showmanship would come from. Right. And uh, I still have tape recordings of my G.I. Joe figures that my mother still has in uh, her apartment in Bayside, Queens, mm -hmm. that uh, she swears she will sell one day. Not if I can help it. <laughs> well, um, eventually, let's get into, uh, I guess, oh no, let me ask, since we're on the subject of childhood, I see you have a stack you know, of cards over yeah, there. Yeah, I have a stack you of cards. You haven't even but, gotten to them. No, no, no. no but I, I, I've been looking at them all day, okay, so I think good. I got it. Okay, I think man. I got it. Um, but before we even get to that, uh, are there was there like a favorite wrestler who did it for you, or is it just just ho so many influenced you? I, I liked antagonists. I like that uh, Eddie Gilbert, the mass superstar, Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, that they could elicit an emotion out of someone that was intense. Mm -hmm. it, it seemed easy to me as I watched my peers growing up for people to like you, to do <laughs> what everyone is doing. It's easy to root for Hulk Hogan and Bob Backlund. <laughs> but it wasn't so easy to get behind the mass Superstar. It wasn't so easy to like Eddie Gilbert. And that's what attracted me. Why is that one person different than everyone else in the arena? And why is he able to elicit this emotion? And um, as, I guess, a detriment, I tried to replicate that behavior in school a lot. I always would try to raise the ire of my teachers. <laughs> and what I didn't realize was I was gaining favor of my classmates. Right. So that's where the original, you know, rule breaker in me came. But those were the people that really, really enticed my, whatever this means, I. Well, so, so you went from trying to antagonize your teacher to becoming one yourself. So how's that feel? I think looking back, it made me a better teacher because I remember I had a student, Douglas Rosencrantz, and I always waited for the Guildensterns to come. And if you laugh at that, good for you. And if you don't, <laughs> read a book. Douglas Rosencrantz was a, was a troubled kid at Cardoza High School, and every class he went to, he was kicked out of. And I was the new teacher coming in, and I think the social studies department thought it would be funny. <laughs> Let's stick the new guy with Doug Rosencrantz. Well, Doug walked in, and I saw myself. And I hearkened back to everything that every teacher that ever turned me off did, and I made a vow that I would do the exact opposite. And lo and behold, at the end of the school year, parent-teacher night, 
um, Douglas's uncle and his mother, I don't know where his father was, came and said that uh, Douglas actually engages them at the dinner table about the Vietnam War that his uncle was in, and Douglas actually likes your class and likes, doesn't go to any other classes, right. but he likes your class and he likes school, and I felt almost vindicated and justified that I may be righted or wrong somewhere. So it, it helped me to be a better teacher because kids want to be spoken to, not at, right. as do adults and humans. And, and that's where I was able to draw on my, my past experiences. When you went to college, it was said that uh, your father was the one that wanted you to finish school. And was school and training and wrestling something you did at the same time? Or did you do them separately? Well, uh, credit goes to my father and my mother. I don't speak about my mother a lot, I think, because I protect that relationship. But I, I often tout my father's wares because of the wrestling connection. But it was both my father and my mother that were adamant that I get a degree. And um, going to school as I got older, I was able to figure it out. It's not hard. Just know what the teachers want you to know. Read the stuff. Make it into something that you can understand. Because a lot of times teachers will try to teach you something in their vision. Right. But if you don't learn the same way I do, and the person behind the camera doesn't learn the same way that we do. So we need to approach it in different avenues. So I figured out school, I figured out college. Right away, I looked at the syllabus. Okay, I have to know this by uh, April, I have to know this by June, cool, read, read, read. I uh, do some other things to kind of get my concentration a little more that I won't discuss here. And then, you know, um, what is it that a body in motion tends to stay in motion and a body at rest tends to stay at rest? So I'm in motion. My mind is working. Boom, here's school. Boom, here's wrestling. I looked at them as one and the same. I studied wrestling the same way I studied World War II. Mm -hmm. You know, just knowing who Rommel was was akin to knowing who Angelo Poffo was. It was all along the lines of just learning and being passionate about something. So it was, some people say, oh, you juggled it. I didn't. It was just, it was all whatever that means. No, I completely get it, because I'm in school Can also. we do it together? One, two, three. I just used gel on this uh, 70s show hair, so I got, like, no snap. Now it wants to snap. All right. So, and we're keeping that. We're going to keep the gel. And, yeah. and by the way, that's how my buddy Christian uh, calls me. He doesn't, doesn't say my name. He just goes... <laughs> <laughs> well, so now I know how to call you. No, Can only, I call only you Christian. Oh, okay. Um, so, sticking with uh, the school subject... Is that something that, because I know that you, uh, you currently go to uh, wrestling schools occasionally and just give advice to uh, whoever's up and coming, whoever's learning the business. Whoever asks. <laughs> whoever asks. Is continuing their education something that you recommend to uh, an aspiring wrestler? Yes, and a lot of times when you say to people, stay in school, they go, oh, bah. but it's just, it's, this is a muscle. And, and you have to use it. So just apply yourself to the things that you're interested in. I mean, if you're not interested in calculus, don't bang your head against the wall trying to learn calculus. You're not going to use it in this world, trust <laughs> me. You're just you're not, you know. But um, if you keep your mind working and you're constantly aware of different avenues in, in every walk of life, you can apply everything you learn in wrestling to life. And I always say that WWE is the Harvard of wrestling. And I mm -hmm. learned under the greatest professors in the world for nearly a decade. I can now approach anything that comes my way in this life based on the tools that I've learned from my instructors at WWA. So yeah, I tell them to just apply themselves to things they're passionate about. I don't say, stay in school, kids, because no one wants <laughs> to hear that. Right. Well, there's another thing that you say, there's a quote that I've heard you use, and that's, uh -oh. <laughs> I don't, it's not bad. It's uh, it's not about how how hard you work. It's about how smart you work. It's not how hard you work, it's how smart you work. Is that uh, is that a motto that applies to everything from from getting bookings to? I think that started for me by trying to find shortcuts. <laughs> as, <laughs> as a kid, no, really, because um, th you know everyone has that little um, trick on how to learn their multiplication tables. Right. If you count it on, I don't even know the trick, but if you count a nine times table on your hand somehow, you can always get the answer. So anytime you have a shortcut and you can work smart, right. no one needs to know how you got the answer unless the teacher says, let me see how you got the answer. So mm -hmm. working smart just really means trying to find a different way than the guy next to you did it and the guy before you did it. They're all doing it the same exact way. Well, let me look at this and see can I do this a different way? Can I do this better? Can I do this differently without disrupting the system? No, I can't. Okay, I'll fall in line. Oh, wait a minute. 
no one ever thought of doing this. It's like with wrestling. Every single match, if there are 12 matches on a card, chances are 12 out of 12 are going to start with two guys locking up. No one even thinks for one second. Why? Why do those two guys lock up? Do, do any of our fans know why two wrestlers, and see it's hard for me to say that word, <laughs> lock up? They lock up to jockey for position to see who's stronger. Right. But when that one match starts with a go-behind and a takedown or something different, you at least know this match is different than all the others. <coughs> things like that. So I just always like to try to find a smarter, better way to do things if it's there. Right. So I think that's worked out for you very well because we've gotten to see you on a weekly basis on a nationally televised I apologize for the last eight years. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think there's a need for that uh, because you're one of my favorite people to watch. And that's um, not just from the commentary perspective, but you were, your face was everywhere. So I guess if you want to apologize, you can um, because you were hosting DVDs. Look what this face has become, too. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, you, you know, you've been hosting DVDs. You kind of become the face for... Uh, the organization. If people want to say that JR was the voice or right now Cole is the voice, you were a face for a lot of the things that they put out there. So I'd say the motto worked out for you. Um, I mean, I want to know as far as success how you managed to get past, because you're a Northeast guy. So you went through uh, ECWA, WUW, um, NYWC. And New Yorkers, we have this, and not just New York, Philly, Pittsburgh, the whole Northeast community has this, uh, I Pittsburgh guess, reputation. Really East? Uh, it's the teacher in me coming out. Well, okay. well it's, it's on the baseball bracket. It's on Is the it? Eastern side. Okay, yeah. then, good. <laughs> Aren't they an NL Central team? Uh, are they now? They are an NL Central oh, team. Oh, man, I got to check. I got to check. 1495 Sports with me. Mm hmm. So, but, uh, you dealt with uh, the Northeast uh, wrestling, you know, community. Yes. That had to be very intimidating. Or was it? Because we have this reputation for being rabid fans. and I, I think that the reputation would be if I was from Muskogee, Oklahoma. But mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Queens, New York. It doesn't get much more New York than that. Mm -hmm. now, I, I've been to the old Yankee Stadium. I've been to Shea Stadium, Madison Square Garden. I, I've been on the 7 train. I've... <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've... John been, Rocker didn't like that train. John Rocker did not like that train. Good for you. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it didn't. But what I found out quickly was, again, it was how to raise the ire. And I credit Todd Gordon from ECW fame for this. When I came in to work for 3PW about four or five years into my wrestling career, which is in South Philadelphia, which was notorious for being a very hard-to-please region as far as the crowd goes, in wrestling at least, and, um, and baseball, because they just... Sorry. But, um, <laughs> and hockey. And basketball. And football. It's hard to I'm please a lot sorry, of people. I'm sorry, Philadelphia. But um, <laughs> Tommy Dreamer is going to come and hit me now. But anyway, uh, so when I walked into 3PW in Philadelphia, Todd Gordon said, listen, you're doing this rock, come on, Tommy Rich, Ricky Morton, Tom Zank, mm -hmm. and they're going to want to kill you. So you can either do that and raise their ire, or you can change. And I said, Ugh. Raise their ire, you say. So I went out and pretended in my mind that I thought everything was great and everyone just wanted me to die, mm -hmm. which hasn't seemed to change. And if you <laughs> give me time, I probably will. But um, so no, I wasn't intimidated. I embraced it. And if you know how, if you know your audience and you know the emotion that you want to pull from them, it's just pulling strings. You know, that's mm -hmm. all it is. And as long as you're genuine and natural and entertaining, people are going to react in, in the way that they want. I mean, there's plenty of times where I'm sure all of us have known a person or a teacher that tries just too hard to be our buddy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's no connection there, none, it's nothing. But then there's that one person that's just themselves and you really feel their genuine interest in you and all of a sudden, we connect. Well, the connection's been made and somehow you managed to get a tryout to the WWE. Uh, you got to be uh, on Kurt Angle's Invitational on more than one occasion. Yes. I was there for the, the East Rutherford one. Yeah. Um, so how was the feeling the first time? I, I know that there was, they kind of turned the whole newspaper, you know, all that uh, craziness 
into, they brought that on TV, but that first time when none of that was going on, what was that like? First time was in Philadelphia. Yeah? Yeah. And um, I felt very comfortable knowing that I was amongst my own. And I realized the opportunity that was ahead of me. And all I wanted to do was just make enough of an impression. I never thought that a guy like me was going to get that opportunity, get that opportunity again, then get a contract, and then be with WWE for almost 10 years. That never crossed my mind. My ego, maybe it was my own insecurity, but I never ever said to myself, man, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take it. <laughs> said, All right, here's what's in front of me. How can I be the best that I can be right here? And I will always remember that in that, after that match, they, they had given me a, a mic um, opportunity, promo time, they call it. And I think I remember it was uh, Kurt Angle says to me, how does it feel to know that you're going to go three minutes with a great whatever? And he goes, yeah. pull the mic, and I go, well, I, think I remember this verbatim. Kurt, I have a question for you. Pause. How did it feel losing a number one contenders match to John Cena? And within those pauses, I felt the energy of the arena. So I knew if nothing else, I at least satisfied my immediate goal. And I'll never forget, after the match, I walked back. And a lot of times you'll see a lot of people kind of like wait for uh, Mr. McMahon to kind of look at them or whatever. And I, I didn't. I just right. kept walking. And if someone grabbed me and said, Vince wants to talk to you. And I, yeah. and I just, <laughs> well, I remember to this day, he said, you show a lot of poise on the microphone. That's good. And I, <laughs> and I walked away. And for me, that was the victory. Right. You know, I didn't think anything other than that. And then, you know, you get the, hey, good job, or hey, we'll <laughs> see you again, or not bad, and that was enough for me. I, I, I could have, I say this all the time, I could have died in my sleep that night, and I would have been fine with it. And I say that a lot throughout my life, and it's not mm -hmm. because I have a death wish or I'm morbid, but it's because I appreciate every little thing that has happened to me. So if you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, if it all ends tomorrow, would I be okay with what I've left behind? Yeah. I would have then, I would now. It's kind of been a dream come true. It's a great love story. That's how I always say it. Um, my affair with wrestling has been a great love story. And um, my great love has, at least WWE-wise, has said, um, listen, I think we should see other people. <laughs> well, what am I going to do? You know, Am I going to get depressed and grow a beard? And Oh, wait a second. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's just a question oh, no. of how you react to things. So, the moment you got signed, in my mind, I'm not sure if other people saw this, there, there's, there's a parallel that people will look at. They'll, they'll say, you know, attitude era, not attitude era. I see something different. Well, when you get signed, I see someone who, it's not where a Ric Flair and a Dusty Rhodes can say they came up from the territory system. You represent this new kind of generation that came up through the independence that's still blossoming and changing as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it like to be representative of that hmm. group? Interesting. I um, try to ask some new questions because yeah, no, I'm no, no, sure... It's, it's good stuff, actually, and, and I do appreciate that, too, because, you know, you do a lot of interviews, and after a while, you just ask the same questions over and over again. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I agreed to, to do it with you guys, because I, I had a good feeling about it, and I'm glad I, that I've done it. But, um, so far... Yes. How does that feel? <laughs> I don't look at it as I'm the, the pioneer or the guy that's waving the flag. I look at it that there were so many guys before me that mm -hmm. had to nudge that door open because um, you have to think about it. ECW did a lot of that because they pulled guys like Tommy Dreamer and Taz from Johnny Rod's school in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and, and they were doing independence, brother. And at the time, the independent scene before me had still yielded some, some viable talent. I mean, a lot of people don't know. Billy Kidman mm -hmm. used to work for the ECWA, and, and, and no one ever looks at it like that. So just coming through that system, I just think it says a lot about WWE's eye. Mm -hmm. They weren't just looking in one area for talent. They realized that there's a whole pool of talent over there. Mm -hmm. And even if they shifted their scope just that much, it says a lot about their business acumen. Because now, CM Punk, Daniel Bryan, mm -hmm. I mean, you can name off the top of your head a dozen guys yeah. that have now blown the doors wide off of this now. And now the FCW um, the developmental system and the WWE Performance Center that happens to open today yeah. now I think is about 50% independent guys. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if guys stay on the independence too long, 
they develop indie habits and they become indie riffic. Mm-hmm. Can they be retaught? Can they learn the WWE style? Because it's a much different style than anything else you're going to experience anywhere else. And and there are a few guys. I, I use Corey Graves as an example. People might remember him as Sterling James Keenan from uh, Norm Connors IWC, I think, in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. But, um, you know, t- to his credit, Corey Graves, Sterling James Keenan, he had to go from being an indie guy to being a WWE guy, and he's good enough to make that transition. Mm-hmm. There are a bunch of other guys that just couldn't wrap their head around it and couldn't learn how to hit WWE pitching. It's a lot easier to hit an 88-mile-per-hour fastball in the mind, double-A ball, than it is to hit a 96-mile-per-hour slider. Who throws a 96-mile-per-hour slider <laughs> in WWE? I mean, that's how I equate it. Is it easy to, well, no, it's not easy, but is it easy, I guess, from a teacher's perspective to speak to people who may have this indie-rific maybe idea, who come in just immediately wanting to do that strong style that they watch from Japan matches or the lucha style that they watch? There's nothing wrong with the strong style. There's nothing wrong with the lucha style. I think when we say indie, it's ego. It's Mm -hmm. a lot of these guys, in my estimation, think they're owed something. Mm -hmm. They deserve something. You can be the king of the Indies. You're this big. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't stop and say to yourself, well, hang on a second. Tony Gurria drove 300 miles every day for no money to wrestle. Those are the guys, they're better than you're ever going to be. You know, and, and it's because of guys that have paid their dues and because of guys that have worked so hard and sacrificed their bodies and their livelihoods and their relationships. You know how hard it is to keep a relationship in the wrestling business? It's virtually impossible. Impossible. But so many guys for the past 100 years have done it so that a guy like Sammy Callahan, for instance, mm-hmm. can get a shot at WWE. And a guy like Smith James, who has his head screwed on straight and, and respects the tradition and the passion and yet still has the, part of the expression, balls to go out and grab opportunity. But some of these kids walk around the Indies and they think that they're, you know, hot sh- because <laughs> they, they get a, a nice little indie chant somewhere. Right. It's a rude awakening, no pun intended, that's coming for many of them. So I just think it's ego. Right. Well... While doing WWE, you were there wrestling for, I believe, two years, managing for one year, and the rest doing uh, commentary and hosting, and you you filled a lot of hats. Uh, Grateful that. Cheap plug. (laughs) As as a a commentator, there's one match that really struck my mind that that caught me, because I used to watch the WWE CW. And I enjoyed it, and personally I think the only reason it got a lot of heat is because it got the letters ECW in it, and people, you know... This word, heat. Yeah, I didn't mean to use that word. No, 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 and I understand that, and that's what the internet has done. The internet has Mm -hmm. has educated a, a fan base to things that normally they wouldn't know. I don't know if it got heat. Awareness, yes. Mm -hmm. Were there still people that were holding on to the old ECW flag? Mm -hmm. Yes, but WWE's ECW wasn't geared towards them. If they chose to watch it, more power to them. But a lot of people try to compare the two things, and they weren't. They weren't the same thing. So, you know, that's one thing that I always like to clear up with people, that it's two entirely different things Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I had read, uh, Tommy Dreamer used to have a blog on WWE. Tommy Dreamer. Never heard of him. And I I just barely heard him, met him once. Um, But he had a blog on WWE. Uh, that was talking about the comparisons between the two and said there, that if you really look at it, there's actually a lot of similarities because you have the people who are trying to remake a name for themselves who would go down to ECW. And you would see that again with uh, Mark Henry, for example, uh, Big Daddy V. Uh, these are people that were down in uh, WWE's version of ECW and kind of remaking a name for themselves. Uh, you had new people like CM Punk uh, who and Bobby Lashley who both started out with uh, ECW and now they're now they're, you know, names Mark Henry world champion, you know, doing great stuff on Raw. And uh, CM Punk, you know, kind of a flag bearer. So I was wondering what your what your feelings towards ECW was cuz I really enjoyed it. I loved it because it gave me an opportunity. 
Mm -hmm. I wouldn't care. I've said this before. I don't care what three letters were on the screen. <laughs> if, if I had an opportunity to compete and perform, more power to it. You know, I mean, so I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the camaraderie that was there. And I also, I was fortunate enough to fall in with a, a group of guys that had been around that kind of took me under their wing and, and taught me. And I was also still kind of teetering between hanging out with the cool kids mm -hmm. and still also being eating lunch at the freshman table. You know, mm -hmm. I was really getting a great education and I was getting to wrestle every night. And I, one night I could have been wrestling Stevie Richards or Little Guido, Nunzio. Mm -hmm. And the next night I could have been in there wrestling um, CM Punk. Mm -hmm. And you really, really get to taste a lot of different flavors and then you come up with your own culinary delights. I, I liked ECW, I liked what it did, I liked the opportunity it presented a lot of people. And um, again, it was a vehicle and a product for WWE to provide entertainment. And if I was a small part of that for a period of time, yay. Also, you did commentary there. And something that caught my attention was that there was one match in particular, it was Alicia Fox versus Katie Lee Burchill, I believe. This is during the DJ Gabriel versus uh, Paul Burchill feud, the little mini feud. And I believe you compared Alicia Fox to Storm and Katie Lee Burchill to The Phoenix, or, or June Gray, or Scarlet Witch. Yeah. And uh, so, so that caught my attention. You had actually mentioned it earlier. Are you a comic book nerd? I am a nerd. <laughs> Plain and simple, I'm a nerd in a normal person's skin. Um, and nerd is a four-letter word. I'm someone that enjoys alternate realities. And I think a lot of people can associate with that, whether it be wrestling or whether it be history or whether it be comic books. I love comic books. Um, I'm ashamed to admit I was a big West Coast Avengers guy. Don't ask me how Hawkeye. I liked him. He had a bow. And how. Hey, he's in a movie. Yeah, now. <laughs> and, um, and, and growing up, for, for me, uh, Spider-Man and Iron Man and Captain America and, and some of the DC comics as well, it, it, they're, they're, they're part and parcel to wrestling because it's an escape. And you knew I was going there, weren't you? Well, it's, it's the obvious track. Yeah. I mean, everyone has someone in their lives. Everyone that's watching right now can think of at least one person that they've known or that they know that they just want to punch once. Just once. I'm really hoping it's not me. And they can't for a myriad of reasons. Hoping that's me. But, that is me. Oh. but, <sighs> Silver Surfer can. Mm -hmm. Dino Bravo can. And as long as you can vicariously live through those people, you are now completely emotionally invested in those people. Even though you know it's not real. I mean, gosh, I can't tell you how many times I've looked up in the sky and wondered where's Galactus and where's Thanos? Where are they? They're, they, they? Are they there? No, they're not there, but just for a one brief moment to escape reality. Because mm -hmm. reality's boring. People are boring. It, it sucks. So if you can just turn a page or turn on something where you can become something else and it inspires you or yeah comic books are fantastic I, I, I love them almost as much as I love wrestling but yeah that's something that uh, I think instantly gravitated me towards you because it's like hey he's a comic book guy I'm a comic book guy so I really enjoyed I, I don't know if other people enjoyed it as much as I did but I enjoyed hearing these things on commentary like and, and you won a Slammy Award. I don't know if that holds the same kind of recognition to you as a championship would, but, you know, you got a Slammy Award for commentary. Does that mean anything to anyone? I mean, Owen Hart made it a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Owen Hart, rest his soul, and I think it's the only time my name and Owen should be mentioned in the same breath, because from what I understand, he was everyone that's ever mentioned him to me. And I, I got to become very friendly with guys like Edge and Christian and, and a lot of, and uh, Test, rest his soul. And mm -hmm. anytime you ask him about Owen, their face lights up because he, he, he was such a genuinely great guy and I never met him but as an aside as far as the Slammy Award goes yeah anytime anyone comes up to you and goes hey good job that's good enough for me and uh, to, to be recognized with the Slammy along with my buddy Todd Grisham who's doing very well for himself right now I stole Todd's Slammy Award by the way it's <laughs> in the College Point storage if anyone's looking for it but uh, yeah it's nice it's nice to be recognized it's nice to be the flavor of the month or the week or the year or the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so let's talk about the moment 
uh, right now you're no longer with WWE. I'm not? No. That, that, at I least sworn I won. That, that's the buzz on the internets. On the internets. We, huh? We're talking about the internets. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've always been with WWE and I always will be. No matter what, you cannot take me away. <laughs> take me away. <laughs> and um, uh, I just want to know, uh, first of all, how you feeling? You know, with my hands. With your hands. And that's the best way to. I use my feet occasionally. That's weird. Call Snitsky. Um, it's how not my I, fault. <laughs> hey, how am I feeling? Um, shit, I, I can't lie to you. It stinks. It stinks. It's your, it's your dream. It's your dream. But I have this weird ability to detach myself from reality and take a step back and say, if I'm the people writing the checks, what's he really doing? Mm -hmm. He's doing interviews on the app. He's doing commentary on superstars. Occasional interview on Raw, SmackDown. Maybe we can make him a manager. C can he still wrestle? And by the way, every day for the last eight years, I brought my boots to work. Mm -hmm. Because as a wrestler, you're always hoping that your name will be on that list. And the few times that it was, I always just kind of, you know, you, you, you kind of, you get like in Super Mario when you eat the mushroom and you get really big, that, that's how you feel. But there's a void and I have to fill that void. Um, mm -hmm. And let me tell anyone that's listening and watching, I can still wrestle, I can still go. And I've learned so much from so many great people and I'm eager to go out there and test myself against the best in the world. Um, so it's a cliche, but it's don't cry because it's over, it's smile because it happened kind of thing. Do I sit in the dark in my living room and watch <laughs> old ECW shows of mine while eating popcorn and sobbing uncontrollably? Of course! But, but since then, I've actually gotten the chance to meet you uh, twice. One was at FWE. We're going to talk about that first. Okay. Uh, at FWE, you actually spoke to uh, PW, uh, PW Insider. Mm-hmm. And there was something that you had said that interests me. Um, you said you referred to yourself as someone who didn't even belong in that ring. Do you still believe that is true? You know, I personally don't think that's true. And I appreciate that. And 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 you earn your spot in WWE. But when I take a step back and I look at all of the great names that have come and gone, and guys that don't have a spot with WWE, or guys that do have a spot with WWE that you don't see on television as much as you should. I say to myself, shut your mouth, kid. You're lucky enough to have been there for as long as you've been there. I, I guess I was just kind of feeling sorry for myself, but at the same time, I, I, I will never ever, I don't ever see myself as Matt Stryker, and that's the problem. And a lot of people say to me, man, you got to go out there and walk around like you're, damn it, you're Matt Stryker. Mm -hmm. And I can do that when the camera's on, but in, in real life, anyone that really knows me out there, I... We all bleed red. You know, we all put our pants on one leg at a time, some of us three legs at a time. But anyway, you look at it, I, I guess at times I just wondered when I looked around at some of the people that weren't being utilized, you know? William Regal, we don't see him enough. And he's out there, and he brings his boots every damn day. Mm -hmm. And if it comes down to who do you keep, William Regal or Matt Stryker, before you can get the st and Stryker <laughs> out of your mouth, Goodbye, you keep William Regal. So that, that's how I was looking at it at the time, but mm -hmm. I got excited. But <laughs> um, looking back now and kind of uh, shaking off the doldrums and the depression and whatnot, I, I, I think that um, I think I'm a pretty good wrestler. Let's talk about arm wrestling. Not arm wrestling. wrestling. Okay, I still got the gel on my hands. Um, it's not gel, it's really bad. Um, the second time I met you was actually before FWE. Uh, this is this at is like that a Star Wars thing you're doing. Yeah, we're going back. We're doing prequels. Um, NYWC, you were there. Uh, this is during WrestleMania weekend. Uh, you were you competed in a six man match, but that wasn't really the reason you were there. There were you were uh, kind of championing a cause, and um, NYWC has a partnership uh, and uh, with some organizations, and they do. It, uh, uh, it's kind of to bring awareness about autism. And you were there for that. And uh, I bought one of the t-shirts there. And I was just wondering if you could speak about that. Normally when people champion a cause, it's something that hits close mm -hmm. to home. So I was wondering if you could speak on that. I think when all is said and done, and they, they put me in a pine box, 
what did I do with the celebrity status that I, you know, created? Uh, I've worked with Autism Speaks and Special Olympics for as long as I can remember, even before I was a wrestler. Uh, WWE has a partnership with Special Olympics that, you know, they, they don't go around and, and wear it on their sleeve, but it's something that they're doing, and good charity is always done blind. But um, growing up, I had teachers that always wanted to put me into 504s, IED, special ed classes, and they ran me through every test under the sun just because I was hyperactive. And that's where I began to really learn about the different degrees of autism. And people think that autism is just, uh, you know, one thing. And it's not there's so many different spectrums and Asperger's and here and there. And, and um, I had a relationship with a lady who had a son who had autism. And before she allowed me to meet the son, she said to me, and he was uh, six or seven years old at the time, she said, don't expect him to make any eye contact with you. Don't expect him to play with you. He's just going to sit there. I said, we'll see about that. Mm -hmm. And within 15 minutes... The kid and I were laughing, connecting, playing, talking, and the mother stood there with her mouth open. And I was able to connect so much with that little boy and his peers. I began to go to his school and help out with all the kids in the class and see the different ranges, and I realized that I had more in common and felt more comfortable there than I did with normal people. Mm -hmm. And it's because there's this world that they live in that no one ever understands or tries to get into. People just assume and they brush it off and they judge. And I felt something about that because that's, that's, how, that's what I went through when I was a kid. And to see them respond gave me a feeling of accomplishment that they're responding to me. And I began to work with them and it's a simple, simple thing as a touch. And I remember one of the teachers saying to me, no one touches these children. So why? Autism isn't contagious. No. And all people need is, is a touch or a look. And you feel things. So I really began to get involved very much with, with autism and, and all the different amazing, amazing capabilities. People say that people with special needs are differently abled. I disagree. I think it's the normal people that are walking around that are the special needs people. And it's the people that, that, that people cast off as special needs that are actually the, the, the special ones because mm -hmm. there's no ego amongst them. There's no gluttony. There's no pride. All they are are true, pure human beings, and all they go on is love. Mm -hmm. And that's something that gets lost so much. Well, we're in Manhattan right now filming this, and, and right now there are thousands of people walking up and down the street, hustling to their next thing, chasing their dollar, wearing their suits, on their cell phones, and they're the people that we call normal. And then when you see that one person off to the side who maybe is, is downtrodden, or maybe they're, they're homeless, or maybe they're, they're not chasing all you look at them and you <clears throat> kind of pull your purse away, or you walk across the street from them. But I tell you this, there's more love and kindness in their heart and more humanity within them than there is amongst all the people in the rat race. Autism is something that they still don't understand. You know, some people believe that there's a, a fungus in the stomach that causes, uh, you know, people to act a certain way. Some people blame inoculation. Some people blame all kinds of different things. But the children and the adults are so wonderful and so special. And from Asperger's to autism to everything in between, it's just, it's, it's, like, it's like sitting down in, in the most comfortable chair that you could be in and just feeling comfortable. I've always struggled with feeling accepted and comfortable in, in all walks of life and I guess the only time I ever feel accepted is when I'm around, you know, people with autism or, or the folks at Special Olympics. I mean, I know I'm going on and on, but you, you're really asking something that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. we, we celebrate our athletes in this world. And we pay them millions of dollars to hit a baseball or to throw a clothesline. And you go to the Special Olympics and you see true competitors true athletes 
and above anything else, whether they win or they lose it, the smiles on their faces are amazing. And, uh, you know, WWE support, supports Special Olympics at Special Olympics, and I support uh, at Autism Speaks. And it's just, if you touch one person's life while you're on this earth, that's more important than any championship you win, how many Twitter followers you have, how over you are on the Indies, brother, how many home <laughs> runs you hit. You touch one person's life, and, and you've done what we've been placed here to do. You know, I mean, life gets in the way so many times, and, and money is the new Satan. You know, I mean, that, that, that's what people took money before God and all this other love, and I'm not going to go on and on, but for me, you know, when they put me in the ground, and any day will do, um, I'll know that at least I, I connected with, with that one boy and, um, and all the people that, that support, you know, that cause. Well, thank you for sharing all that with us. I think that's really awesome. That's something that we, I, I basically agreed with everything that you had to say on that subject. And uh, that was autism. My only goal, was to really be in accord with you. Uh, thank you, thank you. And that's important to me. That's that's <laughs> mine. But uh, but as a psych major, that's something that uh, I'm learning about, and it's something where autism is such a broad. You, you know, you have the one word autism, but it's such a broad term to, that, that reflects so many different things, and that people have not even begun to understand. No. I'm trying this new thing where I want to give seminars that aren't just about wrestling. I want to do something called a day at TV, where we discuss wrestling promos, character developments, really to give people in the wrestling world something that they can build off of to go to promoters and get work. Um, I'll always be a school teacher and I'll always want to help others before I help myself because far greater things await me somewhere else and uh, that's what I'm holding on to so I hope you are too and now I'm gonna leave the microphone alone. All right, so that wraps everything up. Once again, this is Brandon Lewis and Matt Stryker. Thank you for coming down to 1495 Sports. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to great things from this brand.